Let's pick up with that passage then um, at Flourish and Blots. Page 63, where Hagrid goes in and he breaks up the fight between Arthur and um, Malfoy. Malfoy dumps um, Ginny's book, her transfiguration book, back into her cauldron. And, Arth and um, Hagrid says, you should have ignored him, Arthur. Rotten to the core, the whole family, everyone knows that. No Malfoy's worth listening to. Bad blood, that's what it is. Okay? There's an awful lot packed in there. Because of what Rowling is going to do with those ideas later on in the series. Okay? Not as much in this one, but beginning in book three and then continuing on. Okay? We're, gonna, we're going to wrestle, let's say, with the ideas of... Is someone rotten from inside out, or do they learn rottenness? For example, we're going to see in book four, somebody who comes from a pure blood family who makes poor choices, and Dumbledore is going to say to Cornelius Fudge, look at what this person made of his life. He came from... You know, all the right things, he had all the right background, and what did he do, okay? Dumbledore's point is, it's what we choose, okay? So, notice, Molly goes ballistic. If I have an example, you're brawling in public, you know, Fred George, or way to go, Dad, you know. You can kind of imagine, Percy's probably sitting back there, not really figuring what to say, because... You know, Percy always wants to be on the side of power, okay? So, they go off to, um, back home, and then head off to Hogwarts, and Harry and Ron can't get through the barrier for some reason, okay? So, what do they not do? I mean, we know what they do. They take the flying for Anglia. They don't wait. They don't wait. Who do they, who do they not wait for? Because what could Arthur do? He could, you know, contact the school, let them use the food network, be like, or he could take them else. some way. He could fly them himself. He could drive them in the car himself. Okay? That's one thing. Okay? They could send an owl to the school. The barrier wouldn't let Ron and Harry through. Okay? There are any number of things they could do. They would be late, yes. Okay. So Harry and Ron take it upon themselves to fly the flying for to Anglia. They're seen. They get to the school. They land in the Whomping Willow. The Whomping Willow beats the snot out of the car. I shouldn't say beats the snot. Beats the oil out of the car, you know. And then the car drives off into the Forbidden Forest on its own. They get up to the school. They look through the windows at the feast in the Great Hall, page 77. And Harry looks up at the high table, which is a table that sits up here, the Great Hall, as you're familiar from the films. When I um, do my Harry Potter course in London, this is one of the things students actually love the most, is when we go to Christchurch College in Oxford. And they go into the dining hall at Christchurch. Okay. The Great Hall is set up like this in the film, um, excuse me, in Christchurch. In the film, you've got four tables, one for each house, okay? So this is where all the, you know, dignitaries would sit and such, the master of the college and things like that. This is where Dumbledore and McGonagall and all them. Harry looks up there, he scans down the row of seats, and he notices, page 77, hang on, there's an empty chair at the staff's table. Where's Snape? Ron, maybe he's ill, said Ron, hopefully. Like, maybe he's got, you know, plague or cancer or something. Harry, maybe he's left because he's missed out on the defense against the dark arts job again. Ron, or he might have been sacked. I mean, everyone hates him. You know, last time Ron said something like that, what happened? Hermione nearly got killed by a troll. 
Or maybe he's waiting to hear why you two didn't arrive on the school train. And they turn around and there's Snape. So what does Snape do? Where does he take them? To his dungeon, to his office. Where does he not take them? To McGonagall's. To McGonagall's office. They are McGonagall students, as Dumbledore will say. It's up to McGonagall to determine a punishment for them. Okay? So, McGonagall and, and Dumbledore show up. And she says, page 80, Why didn't you send us a letter by owl? I believe you have an owl. You know, Harry's got Hedwig with him. I uh, didn't think, obviously. Okay? So, Ron's thinking we're going to be expelled. Dumbledore says, no, not today. You know, expulsion's a little deep or severe. So he says it'll be up to Professor McGonagall, page 82. McGonagall tells Ron, Ginny is in Gryffindor. And speaking of Gryffindor, she goes on. But Harry cuts her off. He interrupts the teacher and says, um, when we took the car, term hadn't started, so, so Gryffindor really shouldn't have points taken from it, should it? Watching her anxiously. He knows where she's going when she says, speaking of Gryffindor. Professor McGonagall, I love this little passage. Professor McGonagall gave him a piercing look, but he was sure she had almost smiled. What does that mean? She likes Harry. Okay, she likes Harry. And she isn't as mad as she seems like she is. Okay, I think it's more than she that. She kind of like respects his boldness. Respects his boldness? Keep going, though. She also respects that he doesn't want to ruin it for everybody else. He wants to get the punishment for what he did and not reflect on the rest of the others. Okay, but it's more than that. What did Harry say previously? She said, you have an owl, I believe. I, I didn't think that is obvious. She's not, she pointing out the fact that he didn't think about his actions. No, nope, no. Nope. What has he just shown here? He can't think. He thinks very quickly. She starts to say, speaking of Gryffindor, he knows where that sentence is going to end. Gryffindor is going to lose house points because of Harry and Ron. Again, yeah, okay. And what's Harry do? He cuts her off and says, term hadn't started. Gryffindor shouldn't lose any points. It's not fair, okay? And so when we get that, Harry thinks that she almost grins. It's kind of like, oh, she liked that. I, I, I fought quickly. I responded quickly, okay, to this incident. So she says, I will not take any points from Gryffindor, but they still get a detention. Still not fair, right? Term hadn't started. But at least Gryffindor doesn't get punished. So Harry and Ron don't have to go up to the common room and hear, come on, guys, you lost this. Knowing McGonagall, it'd probably be like 50 or 100 points because she'd be really severe on them, much more than Snape would ever be on Slytherin. All right. So, Harry's detention is going to be what? He's going to be signing stuff with Gryffindor. He's going to be addressing envelopes for Griff for um, Gryffindor, for Gilderoy. Gilderoy. Okay. What's Ron going to be doing? Cleaning. Sh polishing time. silver. All right. So they go up to their dormitory room, and what happens? They get fated as, you know, conquering heroes. How cool was this to fly to the school? Okay. They meet Gilderoy Lockhart. Ron gets a howler in the morning. Page 91, Harry's on his way to um, herbology with Professor Sprout, and Lockhart runs into him. He's been looking for him, pulls him aside. Harry, 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 gave you a taste for publicity, didn't I? Gave you the bug. Really? I under 
understand. You want a bit more once you've had that first taste. I mean, okay, I know you're known a bit. Known a bit? What did McGonagall say when Dumbledore has Harry dropped off at the Dursleys? Everyone will know him. He'll be in every book. How many books are Gilroy Lockhart in? The ones he wrote. Yeah. Okay. The ones he wrote. Anything else? How well is he known for defense against the dark arts? Not really. We're going to find out what kind of awards he's gotten. Okay. Very briefly. So. They go on to Sprout's class. They learn about mandrakes. Okay. And we hear... Um, Page 94, Justin Finch Fletchley, talking about his name was down for Eaton. That is, he was on the list to go to Eaton. Eaton is the most prestigious college prep school in England. It's just outside Windsor. Okay? It is where royalty usually goes, and the upper crust of British society. Okay? So Justin saying he was down for Eaton is telling us a couple things. One, he doesn't come from a slouch family. He comes from a high, powerful family within what world? The muggle world. He is muggle-born. Okay? Instead of Eaton, he goes to Hogwarts. Don't know that Hogwarts, you know, ranks the same in the wizarding world. Don't know that it's necessarily higher than Bobata or... Durmstrang, or whatever the American version is. There is supposed to be an American school, but she never names it. This is why you need to get her on time. Um, so, I'm going to skip that. They go on to Defense Against the Dark Arts, page 99. I'm trying to get through this quickly. And they're all sitting there anxiously. Notice what Lockhart is good at. He's like Megamind, if you're familiar with Megamind. Presentation. Okay. The students are sitting there. They're anxiously awaiting him. And Lockhart comes in, clears his throat, reaches forward off Neville's desk, and pulls up one of his books, Travels with Trolls. And he holds it up to show his own winking portrait on the front. Where are authors' portraits usually? On the back cover. On the inside cover. Okay, on the back cover sometimes, if it's a hardback and it's got a slip cover, or on the inside of the back cover, or on the inside of the slip cover. Lockhart's right here. Usually only biographies or autobiographies have somebody's face on the front. Okay? Why? Because you know who it's about. Yeah, because that's who they're about. Travels with trolls. Is it all about Lockhart? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Gadding with ghouls. Is it all about Lockhart? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. You could go with each one of his titles, and notice they're all um, alliterative titles. They're all about Lockhart, okay? So, me, Gilderoy Lockhart, Order of Merlin, third class. Third class? So what does that mean? Okay, what would you think Order of Merlin means? Who's Merlin? Very greatest wizard who ever lived. Okay? I mean, he would really be the greatest wizard. That's why it's the Order of Merlin. Okay? Third class. Like a third class misdemeanor. I mean, if you're going to screw up, if you're going to break the law, do you want to do it third class or do you want to do it first class? Look at it this way. You fly to London. Do you want to fly first class or do you want to fly third class, a.k.a. economy? Coach. Maybe you could say third class is that very last row next to the restroom on the back of the 757. Okay? Third class. 
So what does this tell us? Uh, C. <laughs> He's average. Okay. What else? Honorary member of the DeFarc, DeFarc for, wow, Dark Force Defense League. Joining three words together, DeFarc. The Dark Force Defense League. He's not a real member. So how do you get to be an honorary member of something? How do you get an honorary PhD? Oh, you did a pretty decent job. We're just kind of... You did something kind of important so yeah. they recognize and say, you have an honorary... Member yeah, PhD. you didn't earn it, first of all. Right. That is, you didn't take the coursework, you didn't write the dissertation, you didn't defend it, all that kind of stuff. Okay? You did something else that some college or university is saying, we want to give you an honorarium. We want to celebrate your greatness. So we're going to slap this degree on you. That's what this is. Okay? So if he's an honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League, what has he not actually shown? His skills for defense against the Dark Arts. Exactly. And he saves the most important one for last. And five-time winner of which weekly's most charming smile award. And by the way, the casting here was superb. Kenneth Branagh as Gildroy Lockhart just knocked it out of the park. Okay? But I don't talk about that. Okay? That's a rhetorical device. I can't remember what it's called. I had a student write a whole paper about this rhetorical device in Chaucer last summer. It's, it's this rhetorical thing where you say you're not going to mention something and then you mention it. Okay? It's kind of designed to get the reader, catch the reader off guard. So he says I don't mention that, and yet he did. He celebrated it. He put it at the most important part of the sentence. I didn't get rid of the Brandon Brand. I didn't get rid of the Brandon Banshee by smiling at her. Well, come to learn, by the time we get to the end of the novel, he didn't really get rid of the Bandit Banshee, did he? No. Nor any of the other monsters, evils, dark things that he says he did. Okay? So, he says, I see you've all bought a complete set of my books. Well done. Really? Like they have a choice? These are the assigned books for the class. How else are they going to pass the coursework if they don't buy the books? I had students last semester who attempted, for example, to pass this class without buying the books. They didn't. <laughs> okay. So let's see how well you've read them. They're supposed to have read all the books by the beginning of the semester, all the books for the entire year by the first day of class, and so he gives them a very detailed reading quiz. I do this actually for my course in London, but I don't do the quiz over all the books the first day. I just give about a 25 question quiz over the first book for the first day of class. And it's a niggling little detail oriented quiz. Like, you know, name Dudley's friend who accompanies them to the zoo in the first book, Pierce Polkas. The real Harry Potter nerds you know, know that. Other people think, <laughs> Oh my God, I thought this course was going to be easy and fun, and I'm in London and I can drink, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's usually the latter of one that's the most important. What is Gilderoy Lockhart's favorite color? What is Gilderoy Lockhart's secret ambition? What is Gilderoy Lockhart's greatest achievement to date? Notice nothing about dark arts. It's all about Gilderoy Lockhart. And what is Gilderoy, when is Gilderoy Lockhart's birthday, and what would his ideal gift be? Who gets a perfect 54 out of 54? Hermione. Hermione. Why? She's in love with Gilderoy. Okay. She has the hots for him, let's say. And? She reads all the books before the semester. Yeah, because she's a book nerd. Books and cleverness, she says in book one. Okay. So if there's going to be a quiz over reading material, you know Hermione's going to nail it out of the park. So. He's going to give them a practical lesson. Lockhart pulls out a cage. Cornish pixies. Seamus Finnegan couldn't control himself. He let out a snort of laughter, page 101. Yes? 
Well, I mean, they're not, they're not dangerous, are they? Because they look cute and they're small and they're blue. Don't be so sure. Devilish tricky little blighters they can be. How devilish tricky little blighters are they? Quiet. Quiet. How good is Lockhart at putting the devilish tricky little blighters back in their box? None. None. Sucks. Okay. So we have people hanging from the ceiling. We have other people diving under their desk. We have Lockhart checking out quickly. Who actually gets the devilish little blighters put back away? Hermione, Ron, Hermione, Ron and Harry, largely. So we get to the end of the chapter, page 103. Can you believe him, says Ron. He just wants to give us some hands-on experience, says Hermione. How much of that did they get from Professor Quirrell? None. Harry, hands-on. Hermione, he didn't have a clue what he was doing. Rubbish, says Hermione. Look at all those amazing things he's done. Ron corrects her. He says he's done. Where does he say he's done these <coughs> things? Yes, in, his books. in his books, right? So, Ron introduces an idea here that's kind of important for the rest of this book and to an extent in some of the other books. Can you believe everything you read? What's Hermione's response? Yes. yes. <laughs> if it's printed, it's gospel. If it's on the printed page, it must be true. Okay? So, let's go on a bit. Mud, Bloods, and Murmurs. Um, wood books, the, that is right, yeah, wood books the Quidditch pitch for a practice, okay, he wants to start early, he wants to whip everybody in shape, they're going to win the house cup no matter what, so they're out there getting ready to practice, and the Slytherins start marching across the field, wood goes ballistic, and Flint pulls out a piece of paper, parchment, that shows they have permission to use the field. But notice, Wood already has permission. Okay? So Snape gives them permission because they have a new seeker. So Wood says, Who? Malfoy steps forward. Fred, aren't you Lucius Malfoy, son? Okay. Really? Does Fred not know who Draco is? <laughs> because, I mean, that's a question. He doesn't say, you're Lucius Malfoy, son. It's aren't you. Fred should know already who Malfoy is. Okay? If, for no other reason, on the basis of what happened just a few weeks ago at Flourish and Blots. Flint, funny you should mention Draco's father. Let me show you the generous gift he's made to the Slytherin team. And they hold out their broomsticks and their Nimbus 2001s. Okay. Brand new blah, 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 blah. Hermione, Ron, run out on the field. Ron looks at Malfoy. And Malfoy says, page 112, I'm the new Slytherin, see, Weasley. Everyone's just been admiring the brooms. My father's bought our team. Ron gapes, mouth open. Why? Okay. Yeah, look at the rest of the sentence. At the seven superb broomsticks in front of him. Ron loves Quidditch. And this broomstick is the pinnacle, okay, of broomstick technology. This is like, you know, loving um, Formula One racing and getting to get in a Formula One race car, a Ferrari, a Maserati or something. And not just sit in it, but drive it through the streets of Monaco or something. 
The Slytherin team howls at Malfoy's response. Hermione, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their man. They got in on pure talent. Who's she really talking about? Harry. Harry and Malfoy. Does Malfoy get in on talent? No. He gets in because daddy's rich. No one asks your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. Okay, what is mudblood? Not pure. Not pure, dirty. What is it in our modern language? Yeah, nice benign way of putting it. It's like nigger. Okay, mudblood is an actual term from the early 20th century that was used to describe blacks, people who rose from the mud. The KKK really liked it. Okay, so when Rowling throws that term in there, she knows it has a history. Notice what happens when Malfoy says it. It's like all oh, hell breaks loose. Notice who is coming to Hermione's defense more than anybody else. Ron. Ron. Ron's got the, got the little pitter-patter of the heart for Hermione. It's not known yet, but it's already there. How dare you, says Ron. Plunging his hand into his robes, pulling out his, rock, at his wand. You'll pay for that one, Malfoy. And points it under furious, furiously under Flint's arm at Malfoy's face. Only thing, what has he done? This is the wand tip. This is the part you hold. And Ron's holding it like this. Backfires. Hermione, run, run. Are you all right? Blah. You know, and he starts belching up slugs. Slytherin team's laughing like crazy. Fred and George are still wanting to beat the living daylights out of them. So they take Harry and Hermione, take Ron down to Hagrid's. They get there, and Hagrid says, page 114, after Lockhart leaves, been wondering what you... Uh, when you'd come to see me, come in, come in. Thought you might have been Professor Lockhart back again. Better up than in, he says to Ron. Get them all up. You know, just slugs coming out of Ron's mouth. Okay. So, Harry asks, what did Lockhart want with you, Hagrid? And he says, giving me advice and stuff. 115. Hermione says, I think you're being a bit unfair. Professor Dumbledore obviously thought he was the best man for the job. Notice Dash. I mean, she's not done with her sentence. She's going to say something else. And Hagrid cuts her off. He was the only man for the job. And I mean the only one. Getting very difficult to find someone for the dark arts job. People aren't too keen to take it on, see? They're starting to think it's jinxed. No one's lasted long for a while now. How long has no one lasted long for a while now? A year. Nope. Since Tom Riddle came and wanted to defend against the Dark Arts position. Possibly. At the very least, it's since Harry's parents died. There's been a new defense, to, uh, new defense, against, no, 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 defense against the Dark Arts teacher. This is revealed in either book six or seven. Every year, I think, since Harry's birth. I'm starting to think it's jinxed. It is jinxed. Nobody can can stay in that job. Quirrell, evil. Lockhart goes crazy, loses his mind. Who do we see next book? Remus Lupin. Pretty good defense against the Dark Arts teacher. After Lupin, Mad Eye Moody, extremely good teacher. Okay, turns out not to be Mad Eye Moody. Sorry to give that away. You know, but he's still a good teacher. Book five, we won't talk about she who must not be named. Book six, <laughs> book six knows his stuff. Okay. Book seven, doesn't matter. <laughs> Malfoy called Hermione something. Must have been really bad because everyone went wild. Notice, Harry doesn't know what the word means. Hermione doesn't know what the word means. Why not? Because they're not part of, they weren't part of the Wizarding World until they came to Hogwarts their first Okay, year. why else? 
books. It's not in the books Hermione would read. That is, that word wouldn't appear in approved Hogwarts reading material. Right, it was bad. <laughs> Malfoy called her mudblood. Hagrid dives out of sight. He didn't. He did. But I don't know what it means. I could tell it was really rude, of course. It's about the most insulting thing he could think of, says Ron. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who is muggle-born. You know, non-magic parents. There are some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else. Okay? Remember what Hagrid said about the Malfoys. I'm going to keep it, put it back over here. Keep it up. Rotten to the core. Bad blood. Okay? Hagrid says that about the Malfoys. That's what the Malfoys, however, think about mudbloods or muggleborns. That they are rotten to the core and bad bloods. <clears throat> so, Ron goes on. I mean, the rest of us know it doesn't make any difference at all. Look, look at Neville. Neville's a pure blood. He's pure blood. He can hardly stand a cauldron the right way up. In fact, we come to find out later, Neville's family, <coughs> Neville's grandmother and uncle, weren't even sure that Neville was magical. Until what happened? His yeah. His uncle Alfie is holding him out the window, out a balcony window. Okay. Three stories up and accidentally drops him. And he bounces down the road. And they realize he's okay, other than he drops on his head. You know, might explain some things about poor Neville. It's a disgusting thing to call someone, says Ron. Dirty blood, see, common blood. It's ridiculous. Most wizards these days are half blood anyway. If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. And we're going to get a wonderful scene in book five, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, where we go into Sirius Black's house, the Black family mansion, and we see this tapestry. Okay. This is one of the most amazing things. If you ever go to London and you do the Harry Potter studio tour, not the stupid Disney or uh, not Disney, yeah, Universal one. You go to the set, okay? You go to the studio tour and you see all the props. The tapestry is amazing because it's, I don't know, not quite the size of that wall, but it's almost the size of that wall. It's huge. And you can go in there and you can, you know, okay, there's where Andromeda's name is burned out. There's where Sirius's name is burned out. Okay? So they really make this thing. I mean, the, the detail, just like with the Lord of the Rings films, the detail they put into the little small things um, was very, very extensive. All right? If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. There wouldn't be any wizards. Though, Ron is pure blood. Okay? Neville, as we said, is pure blood. The Malfoys are pure blood. So what must that mean? We come to find this out later. They're related. Ron's related to the, the Weasleys and the Malfoys are related through blood marriage. Why? Because of this idea of having to keep the bloodline pure. And also what happens? Well, if you can't marry off somebody else, you marry your sister or your nephew or your niece, and then you get, you know, three years and all those kinds of things going on. So, Hagrid says, probably a good thing your curse backfired. Lucius Malfoy wouldn't have liked it. And then he asks Harry, or tells Harry, I've got a bone to pick with you. Heard you've been giving out signed photos. How come I haven't got one? <laughs> Harry. And Hagrid says, I'm only playing with you. I know you're not doing it. Okay. You're more famous than him without trying, 117, Hagrid says. Harry, bet he didn't like that. Don't think he did. And then I told him I'd never read one of his books, and he decided to go. Okay. So Hagrid shows them his pumpkins that he's been growing for the school feast. Um, 
and hearing Ron go off to their detentions. Right? Ron's got a polished silver all night. Harry has to address envelopes for Lockhart. And what, what part of that? Is he in Lockhart's office by himself addressing envelopes? No. No, no that'd be fine. He's with Lockhart. He's with Lockhart and... Lots of photographs of himself. The walls are plastered with what? <coughs> photos of Lockhart. And keep in mind, what do wizarding photos do? They move. They move. They can talk. Okay. So he's like surrounded by hundreds of Lockharts. Enough to send one crazy. And what does Harry hear towards the end of that detention? Come, come to Page 120, come to me, let me rip you, let me tear you. Harry Seacon, <laughs> it's gotten to me. What? I know, six solid months at the top of the bestseller. It's broke all records. Is J.K. Rowling maybe suggesting something there about her own books? Because she's the opposite of Walker. She didn't get photos whenever she could. She didn't go on every show she could. She wasn't in every publication possible. She tried to maintain her privacy once she became famous. Okay. To the point of, as an example, she tried her hand at another genre of literature. I mean, the first thing she wrote after the Harry Potter stories was A Casual Vacancy. Horrible book. I started it in a bookstore. I said, my God, this is horrible. Why? Because she's trying to be some high-minded literary giant. And it's just trash. I don't mean trash, sex and porn trash. I mean trash like it belongs in a trash can. Trash. Okay? Then, a couple years later, she wanted to try her hand at another variety of literature, another genre. The detective novel. She created a pseudonym, Robert Galbraith. Okay? She published a novel under that title. It got published. It was actually out. It wasn't selling very well. It was selling, but not very well. And somebody at her ad agency, wait, is it somebody at her, uh, at her literary agents, agency or at the publisher? I can't remember which. Let slip to the wife of a good friend that Robert K. Galbraith was actually J.K. Rowling. This person then leaked it to the media. Overnight, literally, overnight, Robert K. Galbraith, Cuckoo's Calling, became number one bestseller. And it sold out. And they had to go through reprints. And now the other two books in the series, as soon as, as they are announced, as soon as they are available for pre-order, boom, they're bestsellers. One of the reasons is not just because it's J.K. Rowling. They're good. I've read all three of them. They're, for that genre, they are fantastic. And they don't have some of the problems that you have in these books. She's become a much, much better writer. Okay? So, here here's the voice. Um, he tells Ron, and Ron says, hmm, I don't know, I don't get it either, okay? Death day party. Um, Harry runs into nearly headless Nick, and Nick's lamenting, his death day party's coming up, and he can't participate in the headless hunt. Shows Harry the letter from Sir Nicholas de Mimsy Porpington, classical British name. And Harry gets in trouble from Filch, so he'll, Filch hauls him down to his office. And what does Nick do? He creates a ruckus. Yeah, he, he, gets, a he gets Peeves, the poltergeist, to turn over a desk, the floor above. So Filch runs out, and Harry's left there alone. And Harry's sitting there, and on Filch's desk, there's an envelope with a letter, and he sees it and kind of goes over and turns it around, looks at it, and what does he discover? 
Filch is a squib. He has no magical ability whatsoever. Born into a magical family, but he can't do it. Okay? Filch comes back in. He realizes Harry has read the letter because it's not in the exact same position it was. Harry goes out, finds Nick. Nick asks him to come to his death day party. Harry agrees. It's his 500th anniversary of his death day. When is that? What year did he die? 1492. Okay. So it's now 1992. This Harry's not aware of this. Okay. But when he's at Nick's death day party, it's also what? The anniversary of his parents' death day. Okay. The 11th anniversary. So he, Ron, and Hermione go to that. Hermione thinks it'll be fun. They'll learn all kinds of stuff. And as they're getting ready to leave, 137, Harry hears this voice again. Rip, tear, kill. So hungry, so long to kill. Time to kill. I smell blood. And they run and they follow the voice. And they go up to the third floor hallway, the same third floor hallway where Fluffy was hidden before. And now, opposite the girls' restroom, they see writing on the wall. Page 138. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. And underneath, they see Mrs. Norris. Describe Mrs. Norris and what the students think of her. Stuffed cat. Well, not the stuffed cat. It's a real cat. It's Filch's cat. And what do they think of her? They hate her. They hate her. Why? She's kind of like Filch's eyes. Okay. Wherever Mrs. Norris is, you know Filch is not far behind. And there's Mrs. Norris hanging from her tail, petrified. Okay. Harry, page 139. Shouldn't we try and help? Ron, trust me, we don't want to be found here. And we hear Malfoy's voice. So... It's Mrs. Norris, and Harry wants to help her somehow. Dumbledore arrives with McGonagall and Snape and Lockhart. Lockhart says, my office is closest. Let's go there. And notice, while Dumbledore is kind of poking and prodding Mrs. Norris, Lockhart's just, you know, running stream of commentary. He knows what the problem is. He thinks this will solve it, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, what is Filch saying? What does Filch want? Harry's head. Why? He thinks Harry did this because he knows he's a squib. All right? So, Dumbledore says, she's not dead. She's merely petrified. What's Snape's take on the situation? What does Snape think should happen? Well, Potter needs to be punished. For what? What has he done? Being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So, Snape says top of 144. Here he's not being entirely truthful, so, you know, he should be punished. I, I suggest he be uh, benched on the Quidditch team. Okay, now, what is this on the part of Snape? He's, like, trying to make sure his team wins. Yeah, he's just trying to make sure the Slytherin team wins. Okay. McGonagall... Really, Severus, I see no reason to stop the boy playing Quidditch. So they're going at each other because, you know, it's almost like they've got a side bet on their own teams. Dumbledore, innocent until proven guilty, Severus, he says firmly. Really? Is that an actual law in the wizarding world? Is it part of the wizarding constitution? No, not at all. In fact, we're going to see, by the time we get to the end of this novel, somebody is sent off to prison without even a trial. And we're going to hear in the next book, another person was sent to prison for capital crimes for the murder of 13 muggles without a trial. Okay? 
So, Harry and Ron, Hermione start to wonder, what's the Chamber of Secrets? Harry wants to know what a squib is, and Ron explains it. Page 149. They're in the History of Magic class with Professor Benz, an old ghost who, you know, one day went off to the staff room, fell asleep, never woke up, and the next morning got up as a ghost and went on to teach. And Hermione does something no other student has done in years. She asks a question. Implying what? Yeah, that there's interest and somebody's awake. So she asks about the Chamber of Secrets. I deal with facts, Miss Granger, page 149. Not myths and legends. Well, don't myths have a basis in fact? Well, okay, I can see, I can argue that. But, I mean, this is sensational. This is ludicrous. He says, okay, Chamber of Secrets, let me see. So, he gives us a little bit of information about the founding of Hogwarts. About a thousand years ago, the four founders, blah, 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 blah. And the legend is that Salazar Slytherin built a secret chamber, he put a monster in it, and that only an heir of Slytherin could open the secret chamber. Okay? Page 151. They ask about the horror. He says it's supposed to be some kind of beast. But he says, I tell you, the thing does not exist. There is no chamber and no monster. Seamus. But, sir, the chamber can only be opened as Slytherin's true heir. No one else would be able to find it, would they? Nonsense, O'Flaherty. If a long succession of Hogwarts headmasters and mistresses haven't found the thing, okay, notice what Seamus Finnegan is saying. If only in an heir of Slytherin is supposed to be able to find this thing, then really does it matter whether or not you're headmaster or headmistress? Parvati Patil, but you'd probably have to use dark magic. Just because a wizard doesn't use dark magic doesn't mean he can't. Notice, if the likes of Dumbledore, Dumbledore said book one, Voldemort has powers I shall never have. How does McGonagall reply? Only because you're too noble to use them. Okay? So, Ben shuts that down. Doesn't exist, it's just a myth. Okay? One fifty four. They go back to the scene of the crime and they see spiders all in a line scuttling away. Harry and Hermione go up closer to watch the spiders. Ron backs up. Why? 155. I don't mind them dead, says Ron. I just don't like the way they move, and Hermione giggles. It's not funny. If you must know, when I was three, Fred turned my, my teddy bear into a great big filthy spider because I broke his toy broomstick. Okay? Fred's two years ahead of Ron, so Fred would have been five. So what did Fred just do at the age of five? Transfiguration. transfiguration. Minor transfiguration? No, pretty, major. pretty major. He takes an inanimate object and does what? Changes, Changes it into a living, breathing organism. And he does it without ever having lessons and without a wand. Can he do that? <laughs> Within the wizarding world that um, Rowling creates for us, and within rules and laws that she kind of drags out later in the series, no. This should be impossible. This is an example. Yeah. It shouldn't be when, like, when Harry Potter like, made the glasses appear without lessons or a wand, should that also be impossible? No, because that's unfocused. That's the difference. That is an, um, we're told, that's an unfocused kind of explosion of magic. Like when Harry's running from Dursley and his gang, and he ends up on the school building roof. Okay. Or Neville bouncing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or Neville bouncing. That's, it's, 
that's not kind of laser-like focus, okay? This is, this is advanced magic. This is why they offer classes in transfiguration. If you're able to do this at five, should you even need a class six years later? If Fred could do this at five, imagine what Fred could do when he was 11. If Fred could do, well, let me put it this way. If Fred could do this at five, then what could Tom Riddle do at five? Okay. And again, it's without a wand. You need the wand, we're told, in order to channel and focus that magical power, that magical ability. Okay? He shouldn't be able to do this at all. This is an example of just some poor writing. Possibly because when she later says that you can't do this kind of thing, what else should happen? Say that un -aid, un -aid would with the form yeah. such and such and this. I mean, what's more significant? Turning a stuffed teddy bear into a spider or making a pudding hover? Is, is one of those more advanced magic than the other? Oh, yeah. Okay. So... Did Fred get in trouble? No. Is there a letter from Mafalda Hopkirk somewhere on Fred's file? Maybe. No. In fact, go back even further. Um, when Petunia bursts in the first book, she talks about her sister coming back from that school with, you know, frog spawn and everything and turning teacups into things. When? At home, during the summer holidays. Yet, Rowling tells us there are laws that forbid that kind of thing. Lily's parents were not wizards. They clearly must have changed the laws. Either they clearly changed the laws, or she has accounted for it somehow in Pottermore. Because that's what she usually does. When people find big major flaws... She weaves some convoluted excuse for it in Pottermore. Yeah. It says in book six somewhere that like if you won't get an owl if your parents are also wizards because um, it's up to them to inform the ministry. So that could be a lie. Her parents. But her parents no, weren't I'm wizards. About Fred. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible. Okay. Um. So, oh, lost my place. So, Ron's got a problem with spiders. Okay. Uh, they meet Moni Myrtle, and Percy sees them coming out of the restroom. Um, and Percy's a prefect in this book. Page 158. Fred, uh, Ron says, You're just worried I'm going to mess up your chances of being head boy. Five points from Gryffindor. Percy's a prefect. He's just taken five points. Book five, we're told, prefects can't take points. <laughs> okay. And I hope it teaches you a lesson. No more detective work. Okay. So, Hermione comes up with the idea, make some pollen juice potion. We'll find out who the heir of Slytherin is. Who, what, what is she thinking? Who's going to know? Malfoy. After all, let's use the language Quirrell uses about Snape. He does seem the type, doesn't he? Okay. So, Polyjuice Potion takes about a month, so we've got a long time for it to take effect. Um, they have their Quidditch match, and the Bludger's going after Harry, page 170. Harry says... Let me fight off the bludger. You guys go on. Fred, don't be thick. It'll take your head off. Woods looking from Harry to the Weasleys. Alicia, Oliver, this is insane. You can't let Harry deal with that thing on his own. Let's ask for an inquiry. Harry, if we stop now, we have to forfeit the match. Harry's thinking, we're not going to lose. 
not to Slytherin. And we're not losing the Slytherin just because of a crazy bludger. George looks at Wood. This is all your fault. Get the snitch or die trying, Harry. Right? So the bludger takes Harry out. He falls, arms broken, opens his eyes, and there's Gilderoy Lockhart. No, no. He fixes his arm, kind of. It's no longer broken. Okay. And Harry is taken up to the hospital wing to regrow his bones back. While there, Harry wakes up with Dobby sitting on his chest, 176-77. Dobby kind of lets out. He was the one who kept Harry from going through the barrier. Dobby says, I had to keep you from trying to come, page 177. Harry asks Dobby, why do you wear that thing? The pillowcase with the head and armholes. Tis a mark of the house of enslavement, sir. Dobby can only be freed if his masters present him with clothes, sir. Family's careful not to pass Dobby, Dobby even a sock, sir, for then he would be free to leave the house forever. Okay. He mentions the bludger was my work. Harry, like, you're trying to kill me. No, 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 never. You know. Or if Harry Potter only knew. Okay. Listen to what Dobby says. 177-78. If he knew what he means to us, who's the us? To the lowly, the enslaved, the dregs of the magical world. Okay? Who are the lowly, the enslaved, the dregs of the magical world? House elves. House elves? That it? Centaurs. Didn't you mention you said centaurs were one? Because in book five, when the ministry was like, okay. they were in the ministry. Okay. Could it be centaurs too? Who else could it be? Werewolves. How about all non human magical creatures. Because how do the human magical creatures treat the non-human magical creatures? Okay. How do some of the human magical creatures teach, uh, treat other human magical creatures? Like lower than them. Okay. So anybody who is looked upon as lowly or dregs how does Malfoy look at Weasley? Lowly. Dregs. <clears throat> Riff raff, we're told. Dobby remembers how it was when he who must not be named is at the height of his power, sir. We house elves were treated like vermin. He said, well, of course, I still am, but mostly, sir, life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over he who must not be named. And then look at the language he uses. Harry Potter survived. The Dark Lord's power was broken, and it was a new dawn, sir. So, before the Dark Lord's power was broken, what was it? Night. Night. And Harry, Cop Harry Potter came, and what did he do? Oh, I don't know. Think maybe the prologue of St. John's Gospel. A light shined in the darkness. It was a new dawn. Okay? I'm not grasping at this. The illusion is there. Harry Potter shone like a beacon of hope for those of us who thought the dark days would never end. Notice, dark days, capitalized, dark. And now terrible things are to happen now that the Chamber of Secrets has been reopened. Okay. Ben said there was no such thing as the Chamber of Secrets. Dobby, not human, not bound by human laws. What? Dobby's just said, not only is the Chamber of Secrets real, it's been reopened. So there is a Chamber of Secrets. Tell me, Dobby. Oh, that's not my own, that's no more. So Harry's like, uh. And Dobby says, you can't go, you can't. You're, Harry Potter needs to go home. Harry, one of my best friends is Muggleborn. She'll be first in line if the Chamber really has been opened. <laughs> Harry Potter risks his life for his own <clears throat> friends. Greater love hath no man than this, than that he is willing to lay down his life for his friend. Harry Potter risks his own life, so noble, so valiant, but he must save himself. Okay. Someone comes in the hospital wing, Dobby disappears, and what does Harry watch? Because he pulls the little curtain back. 
In comes Dumbledore and McGonagall with a body, Colin Creevy. They open Colin Creevy's camera and smoke comes out. The film is burned. What does this mean, Albus? McGonagall asks, page 180. It means, Dumbledore says, that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed open again. Okay, so Dobby's saying it one thing. Dumbledore is saying it. <coughs> makes it real. Makes it real, real. But Albus, who? Question is not who, but how. Notice the word who. Not who, but what is she doing? Rolling. What do you do with this, these letters to get this? Foreshadowing. What Tom does when they're down in the Chamber of Secrets. Only here, she does it with one word. Okay? So, Lockhart comes up with the idea of the dueling club. Good idea, right? Might be a nice, useful thing to learn how to duel. Only problem is, Snape does teach Malfoy how to duel, and where does Lockhart teach Harry? You know, just kind of wave your wand like this. Do the wandy wavy thing. Doesn't do any good. But what do we learn from the dueling club? Dead air is a parcel tongue. Page 196. Harry, I what? What do you mean you were there? You heard me. I heard you speaking parcel tongue. I spoke a different language. How? What does it matter? As long as Justin didn't have to join the Headless Hunt. Hermione, it matters because Salazar Slytherin, that's what he was famous for, man. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you were his great-great-great-great-grandson. Harry starts to think, could I be a descendant of Salazar Slytherin? And what does he mean? Remember, sorting hat comes down on his head, Slytherin, man, I ought to go in Slytherin. You could be great. It's all there. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip a bunch. Harry leaves Justin, um, he leaves the library where Ernie McMillan and Hannah Abbott are talking. And Ernie says things about Harry living with the Dursleys. And Harry says, you'd hate him too if you'd lived with them. And he leaves there, goes on his way, and who does he run into? Somebody who's been fearing Harry ever since the dueling club. Justin Finch Fletchley. Lying stiff as a board. But not only Justin. Who else? Nearly headless Nick. Not quite stiff as a board because, you know, smoke doesn't become stiff. <laughs> but he's congealed, let's say. Page 202. He couldn't just leave them lying there. He had to get help. Every instance, Harry wants to get help. Okay. He gets caught, and he, Ron, and Hermione, okay. next chapter, Apologies Potion, Harry goes up to Dumbledore's office. Dumbledore has one question, just one. Harry goes to Dumbledore's office, he walks in, he sees Dumbledore's bird, and it goes poof. And Dumbledore explains about phoenixes, page 207. It means they can carry immensely heavy loads. They're tears of healing powers. They make highly faithful pets. Okay? So, anything you want to tell me about Harry? Nope. Not at all. Why? Why doesn't Harry tell him? Um, yes, Professor Dumbledore. I'm hearing voices all the time. And what are those voices telling you to do, Harry? Are you going to harm yourself? Are you going to harm your neighbors? Do we need to get the men in the white coats? You know, that's what Harry's thinking. What did Ron say? Even in the wizarding world, yeah, even in the wizarding world, it's not good to hear voices that nobody else hears. Okay? Why does Dumbledore ask him? 
Anything you want to share with me, Harry? Who knows? We learn later on, Dumbledore is an accomplished what's called legilimens. He can, quote unquote, read your mind. Okay? He knows! But what does he want? He wants Harry to tell him. Okay? Like Gandalf, he's not going to force Harry to do something against his will. So, Harry and Ron go down to the <laughs> Slytherin common room. And what do they discover? Malfoy's not there. Malfoy's not there in Slytherin. Okay. And we get this very secret diary. Harry takes the diary from Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. And he goes back up to his room. And what do they realize before he actually writes it? Okay, the diary has T.M. Riddle written on it. And we know T.M. Riddle was, a, was at the school 50 years ago because Ron shined a plate, polished a plate, that was given to T.M. Riddle for services to the school 50 years ago. Okay, so 50 years ago, 1942. Okay? We know the diary was bought in London because it has a manufacturer's name and place on it. Vauxhall Road, a real road in London. Page 233, Hermione. I don't know if we make it through this or not. We know the person who opened the Rick Chamber last time was expelled 50 years ago. We know T.M. Riddle got an award for special shirt. Special services to the school 50 years ago. Well, if Riddle got a special award for catching there of Slytherin, his diary would probably tell us something. Ron says, brilliant theory, Hermione. But the diary is what? Mm-hmm. Blank. Okay. So she tries a variety of spells. Doesn't do any good. Um, Valentine's comes and goes and Harry goes up to his room he takes the diary gets a blob of ink and drops it on the diary and it gets sucked in and disappears. Harry's like, okay, that's different. Because he saw what happened earlier in the day when the bag ripped and ink spilled on it and it disappeared. So, pulls out his quill and he writes, my name is Harry Potter. Hello, Harry Potter, my name is Tom Riddle. How did you come by my diary? And Harry says some things and he asks about the Chamber of Secrets And Tom Riddle says, of course I know about the Chamber of Secrets. In my day, they told us it was a legend, but it was a lie. In my fifth year, so Tom Riddle was in his fifth year in 1942. So 41 was in his fourth year, 40 in his third year, 39 second year, 38 first year. So he was 11 and 38, so he was born in 1927. Okay. Who is a third year in 1942? Hagrid. Okay. So Hagrid's two years behind. So Hagrid's born in 1929. So at the point of this book in 1992, okay, so Tom Riddle was how old then? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So Tom Riddle is now 65. Hagrid is 63, to give you a little idea of how old Hagrid is. Okay? So what does Tom Riddle show him? Hagrid did it. Harry comes out of the memory, and he tells Ron, page 248, it was Hagrid. Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago. Okay? Very next chapter, Cornelius Fudge. Why? They're going to go down and talk to Hagrid. Harry and Ron are. So, 
They hear the voice again, Harry does. And Hermione says, I got to go to the library. Harry goes down to, um, after Hermione gets frozen, Harry and Ron go down to Hagrid's hut. They just don't even really get to talk to Hagrid before they hear the knock on the door and they pull the invisibility cloak back over them. Dumbledore comes in with Fudge. Why is Fudge there? Okay, yeah, take Hagrid to Azkaban, but why? He has to be seen doing something, he says. What does he mean? Even though we, the Ministry of Magic, aren't doing anything, we have to be seen. <coughs> What's it all about? Appearances. <coughs> yeah. I've got to put the blame on somebody. Okay? So it'll only be for a short stay, he says. Hagrid's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean? Not Azkaban, top of 262. And before Fudge can answer, there's another loud knock on the door. Lucius Malfoy shows up. So not only is Hagrid going to be removed to Azkaban, describe Azkaban in our real world terms. Give me a prison like it. Oh, Russia? Guantanamo? Russian prisons. Russian prisons? Okay. Everybody says Guantanamo. No, not at all. Do you realize how nice Guantanamo actually is? I mean, for the, the non-combatants, you know, who are currently being held there, for example, I mean, they get like five-star hotel meals. They built a $3 million soccer stadium. Yeah, they built a $3 million soccer stadium. 500 grand just for the sod field. For these guys to play soccer on. Okay? Regular exercise, prayers seven times a day, the whole nine yards. They leave there, go back to Saudi Arabia, go back to Jordan, go back to wherever. They're never going to have it as nice. Yeah, I know there's interrogations, and those aren't nice. <laughs> okay? Soviet Russia, the gulags. No. Why not? What does Azkaban have that no earthly prison has? Dementors. Dementors. And I don't care how rotten and foul a prison guard you can imagine. They might rape you. Happens. They might kill you. Happens. What do they not do? They don't dement you. They don't take your mind away. They don't kiss you and suck your soul out of you and leave you a vegetable. They might beat you till you're a vegetable, but that's a different thing. Okay? Hagrid is scared to death to go here. Malfoy comes in. So not only is Hagrid leaving the school, Dumbledore's leaving the school. And they each leave parting words. What does Dumbledore say? Yeah, kind of. You'll find I will never truly have left this school as long as there are some still loyal to me. Okay, who is still loyal to Dumbledore? Who else? No. McGonagall, Snape, Flitwick, Sprout, Pomfrey, Hagrid, all the teachers, vast majority of the students. We could probably take Slytherins out. Okay, and then what does Hagrid say? Yeah, and if you want to, if you want the answers to anything, follow the spiders. And Malfoy's like, okay, <laughs> you know, he's even weirder than I thought. So Harry and Ron follow the spiders. They get led off to Aragog, and what does Aragog tell them? Hagrid didn't open the Chamber of Secrets, but when the Chamber of Secrets was open last time, a student died, a girl. And what do they put together? Moaning Myrtle. Myrtle, girl's bathroom, 50 years ago. They go up to Hermione's room, Hermione's hospital bed. They pry the piece of paper out of her hand. What's that paper from? A library book. A library book. 
This is like writing in the Gutenberg Bible, you know, if you're Hermione. A library book? And she ripped it a page out of it? Wow. And what did she write on it? Pipes. The page is about the basilisk. So now they know how the basilisk is moving throughout the school. Okay? They're about to go tell McGonagall and everything. What do they hear? It's like loudspeakers. Everybody back to your rooms. They go to the staff room. They over here, another student has been harmed. This time, taken. Ginny. So what do the teachers do? That's it. Close up shop. Turn off the lights. Last one out of the room. No. Lockhart comes in after a nap, and they turn on him. Oh, you were saying yesterday you knew exactly where the Chamber of Secrets was. Now is your time, Lockhart. They all pile on him. Why? There's one reason. To get him out of their hair. <laughs> to get him to leave. He goes off to his office. Harry and Ron go with him. They discover what they knew all along. He was a complete and total fraud. Okay? So, they go down to the Chamber of Secrets. Harry figures out how. And he meets Tom Riddle. I'm going to skip a whole bunch because I want to get to the debriefing scene. He meets Tom Riddle. He and Tom talk quite a bit. Harry's like, I don't understand why you're interested in me. I mean, Lord Voldemort was long after your time. And Tom has Harry's wand, and he writes Tom Marvolo Riddle in the air, and then waves his wand, and it turns. And Harry's like, you know. They duel, so to speak. Harry cries for help. Fox arrives, brings the sorting hat. He cries for help again. The sorting hat drops the sword of God of Gryffindor on his head, so that he kills the basilisk. And then Fox cures him, and he destroys the diary. He gets everybody safely back upstairs, and notice how Dumbledore kind of clears the staff room. He gets everybody out so that he can have a few minutes alone with Harry. Page 332. Sit down, Harry. Harry sits down, and Dumbledore says, You must have shown me real loyalty. And so you met Tom Riddle. I imagine he was most interested in meeting you. And Harry just blurts out, Riddle said I'm like him. Did he now? And Dumbledore plays counselor. And what do you think about that, Harry? How does that make you feel? You know, I, I don't think I'm like him. I'm in Gryffindor. And then he just kind of slumps. And he says, the sorting hat told me I'd have done well in Slytherin. Because I can speak parcel tongue. Everyone thought I was Slytherin's heir. Dumbledore, you can speak parcel tongue, Harry, because Lord Voldemort, who is the last remaining ancestor, wrong word, by the way, does yours have ancestor or descendant? Ancestor. Okay. Mine has Harry in it. Yours has what? Harry. Instead of Percy. Percy, I have that too. I have Harry. In certain parts of the book, instead of Percy, I have Harry. Really? Yeah, yeah, me too. Wow, I've never heard of that. What page is the Ancestor Descendant thing on? Bottom of 332. See, this, and this isn't a typo thing. This is where her original reading had Ancestor, and then they changed it during the printing to um, Descendant. Descendant. Yeah. This is, a, this is one of the, this is from 1999 or 2000. It's one of the first... American paperbacks, okay? Um, anyways, Voldemort, who's the last remaining descendant of Salazar Slytherin, can speak personal. Notice what Dumbledore says here. Unless I'm much mistaken, he transferred some of his own powers to you the night he gave you that scar. Okay? Harry hears that, and then he interprets it. He puts it in his own words. Notice how Harry changes what Dumbledore says. Dumbledore. He transferred some of his powers to you the night he gave you that scar. Voldemort put a bit of himself into me. Notice the change? Transferred some of his powers 
put a bit of himself. Put a bit of himself takes us to book six. It's not the same as transferring powers. Okay? That's rolling, setting us up for book six and the whole talk about Horcruxes. Dumbledore, certainly seems so, and Dumbledore validates Harry's interpretation. Okay? Harry, so I should be in Slytherin. Why? Rotten to the core. I've got Voldemort in me. Okay? Dumbledore, no. Sorting that put you in Gryffindor. Why? Come on, Harry. Think. You can do this. Because I asked not to go in Slytherin. Exactly. Here's the money quote from this book. This is the kind of the moral, if you want. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are. Far more than our abilities. It is our choices far more than our abilities. If it were our abilities then that would make Voldemort the greatest. But he's not. Okay? And Dumbledore is looking at Harry, and it's like Harry doesn't quite believe him. He says, you need proof? Look at the sword again. And he hands the sword to Harry. And what does Harry see written on the blade just beneath the hilt? Godric Gryffindor. And Dumbledore says, only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that sword out of the hat. Who did the hat belong to? Godric Gryffindor. We're going to hear in the next Sorting Hat song. Okay? So what does it mean? Only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that out of the hat. You have to truly want the house. Okay, one who truly does belong to that house, but it's more than that. A descendant. Only a true descendant of Godric Gryffindor. In other words, Voldemort, true descendant of Salazar Slytherin. Harry, true descendant of Godric Gryffindor. Okay? Kind of doing battle again. All right, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with Prisoner of Azkaban Thursday. I'll have your papers for you, your exams for you on Thursday.